So we were able to challenge them. We were able to tell them that you have a problem. Right? You better change your style, otherwise uh, the tolerance not in the team, tolerance with you. Now, that is something we could do, uh, which uh, because of our seniority, they took us seriously. Okay. Right? Okay. So sometimes grey hair helps. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody, this is Deepa Nagarajan and I bring to you the Growth Caliber podcast. Today I have a very special guest uh, that I'm, uh, I have invited to share great insights and inspirations both in the business and specifically in the entrepreneurial space and we are going to be having a very candid, really honest and very uh, insightful discussion about what it takes to build a successful business and what it what it means to be an entrepreneur what are some of the challenges that uh, family businesses and small and medium businesses face uh, when they are in the growth and the scale uh, stage right so let me introduce our guest we have one of the most celebrated business mentors, executive coach and leadership facilitator, Mr. Cherian Kuruvilla. He comes with 40 years, over 40 years of overall leadership experience. He has for the last 13 years been a business mentor, leadership mentor, executive and holistic personal coach, strategic leadership facilitator, a panel member, a speaker and a writer and you'll hear more about him from the horse's mouth. Um, he's focused on changing the growth path of the mid to large family business and the SME sector entrepreneurs, solo entrepreneurs and corporate leaders mid to CXO level. Let me share a little bit about his, uh, his firm. He is the managing partner in his firm CNC Transcend Management, Management Services since its inception in 2010. The firm has been recognized purely on merit among top 10 most admired outsourcing firms and 10 most recommended management and strategy consultants for medium to large enterprises. Based on their core offerings and excellent client feedbacks and the impact that they have been able to create. You can find more details about his firm on www.cnctms.com. We'll also leave the link in the description below. Uh, Cherian comes with around 30 years of hands-on results and process-driven uh, corporate CXO experience in sales, marketing and branding, PNL operations, retail, HR, large scale project management, including leadership roles like director, executive director with Modi Xerox slash Xerox, where he spent 16 years from the startup stage and grew up in the ranks across four locations and six roles. He spent the next seven years in the telecom domain as the CEO, Karnataka, with Bharti Airtel Broadband and also as the senior VP with Reliance Communications, both from the startup stage, uh, both, both of these organizations from the startup stage. And finally, as the director of operations with a US-based Manpower Inc. focused on HR search managing eight industry verticals. We'll learn more about his uh, experience and the contributions that he has made to the corporate world as well as the entrepreneurial space. So welcome Cherian. Thanks for making it to the show and great to have you here. My pleasure. Thank yeah, you. and um, we really wanted to have you on the Growth Caliber podcast. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of insights and learnings that we can get from you on how to grow and scale an organization. Sure. And this podcast actually focuses on that to help organizations understand what are those nuances of growth and scale and how they can, you know, uh, avoid some of these mistakes that happen, you know, in that growth and scale phase and what they can do to, uh, you know, course correct them and try even avoid uh, making uh, such mistakes, right? So it'll be great to hear from you. I know you were not keeping well, but you still made it to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so there is so much actually in your profile. I, I was reading it and I shared some of the key highlights, but it would be great to hear from you a little more about your corporate uh, experience and the entrepreneurial space. What made you move that? Uh, make that shift from uh, the corporate world to the 
entrepreneurial space and become a mentor, a sought after mentor and a coach. So how did that transition happen? What were those learnings from the corporate world that you wanted to bring? Uh, why, why that shift? Why the shift? Okay. Yeah. No, so I, like, like you mentioned, I think you are, your introduction was way too generous. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the fact is that uh, the experience just built up along the way. It, uh, you know, after my engineering, I just started off my career with sales. And okay. that was very unlike me because I'm basically an introvert. Mm -hmm. uh, in my college, I was the quietest guy in my class. Oh. Even, okay. even today, 40 years later when we meet, I'm the quietest guy in, my, in the batch. I right? see. So joining sales was very, you know, unlike kind of a decision. Right? Mm -hmm. Normally one would move into a technical kind of a line. How, how was the decision? I mean, was it some campus uh, recruitment or no, was no, it we just had to find a, a, This is in the 80s. We had to find our own jobs. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. Right? So uh, I started at Crompton Reeves as a Reeves. marketing engineer, mm -hmm. right? selling lights and fans. But I think that gave a lot of experience because... I realized that to be successful in sales, you don't have to be very talkative. Mm. You have to talk sense. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And build a good rapport with your stakeholders. Like in my case, initially, I was dealing with dealers and distributors in Calcutta, right? Okay. Since I knew the local language, it made it much easier. Mm -hmm. So I think those first two years or three years in that organization gave me a lot of confidence that I could do well in sales. Right? It was a okay. gamble that I took at that point of time. And uh, then there was this company, Modi Xerox, which came up in 84. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were looking for different kinds of levels, different kinds of roles. There was a position for an area sales manager mm -hmm. with five to seven years of experience. Mm -hmm. And I had two and a half years of experience. Okay. And I applied for it. Okay. I said, what? Well, worst case, I won't get that particular role, right? Okay. But I got it. Okay. I, got it. I, got it. I got a role which was asking for double the experience. Mm -hmm. And that was a team leader role. I was area sales manager. I never mm -hmm. managed people. Mm -hmm. So I think... Uh, what, what, what was that key decision-making point for the person who was hiring you. How did that happen? How did the decision happen? They must have seen something in you that said, okay, no, this person can. Uh, like I said, I was quiet, you know, but I think maybe because of my 30 years of meditation. Okay. Uh, that time I didn't have 30 years of meditation. I just started meditation in college. All right. But there was a calmness which I had always, right? Mm -hmm. Which gave confidence to other person. So that assurance, that, that confidence yeah, that you Quiet had. confidence, right? Yes, and yes. That, oh, this guy will do okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe he doesn't have the relevant experience, but he pick up on the job. Okay. So I think that was the turning point. So if I had not taken that gamble again, so I think my career has been full of gambles. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> if I had applied for one level lower, possibly my career would have gone on a totally different tangent. Mm -hmm. right? But because I aimed for something higher and got it, I did well. Okay. You know? So I think that way, uh, never sort of hesitated to take challenges. Never okay. hesitated to take challenges. I said, I'll figure it out along the way. All right. So I think that's been part of my DNA. Okay. That, you know, okay. don't think too much. Mm. Plunge in, figure it out. You know, along the way. Okay. <clears throat> so the next role was a branch manager role where you know, out of eighteen branches, that particular branch was number eighteen. Mm -hmm. They said, "Would you be interested in going there?" And I said, "I'll take it, no problem." Okay. Right? And within two years, I made it number one location. Mm -hmm. So that was a turnaround kind of an experience of turning around a non-performing location into a performing location, not mm -hmm. only performing the number one in the country. Mm -hmm. So I think my confidence kept building up along my career. Okay. That whatever role I get into, I'll figure it out. Right? Sure. I think that confidence kept building. I think that is what kept me going. So I was always willing to take gambles, uh, try new roles, try new locations, mm -hmm. move around. Uh, with a lot of family support, of course. Moving around from location to location is not easy. Yes, it's not, it's easy. not easy. So we moved from Calcutta to Cochin, from Cochin to Delhi, Delhi to Bangalore, Bangalore to Bombay, Bombay to Bangalore. Wow, right? that's, that's all, like all, all key locations so in the country. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so wherever my career took me or wherever the opportunities came, which I felt were good, I just sort of took it. Okay. So that's been my career. So even whether it was a product management role or whether it was moving to telecom, which I knew nothing about. Right? How did that shift happen from Modi Xerox, which is a product-focused organization, to telecom, which is services, broadband services, right? Yeah. So, what, what was that uh, Modi shift all also about? Was, so Modi Xerox also was a service services okay. Because, you know, okay. we were supplying the equipment, okay. but the equipment was being used by multiple users. So right. you know, the, uh, customer experience was a very important part of the mm -hmm. Modi Xerox portfolio as well. Mm -hmm. right? But then I had 16 years of experience, and Modi Xerox is a very process-driven company. Process okay. is very process-driven, policy-driven Okay. Good culture. Okay. I stayed there for 16 years. Many others have stayed there for 10, 15 uh, years. Okay. So I think that was a place we all enjoyed and learned and grew. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so then 
telecom was a new opportunity which came up my way okay. and uh, although i knew nothing about telecom again i didn't hesitate i said figure it out along the way okay. it's something that you can learn right because the fundamentals of leadership are same true fundamentals true. are whether you're in this industry or that industry so i moved from consumer durables to modi drops to office automation mm. to telecom to hr mm-hmm. right so over my 28 years of corporate life i mean i was not confined to one industry one location one kind of role mm. so i was never a specialist i was a generalist generalist right okay and i think that is the width of experiences that i think uh, came and in and i also here. probably uh, from what you say i i feel it's also the fact that you were execution focused yeah, execution. and that success that you were able to bring in your execution the drive yeah. I think that's uh, the key differentiator. Very research focused. Presence. Very research focused. I think I developed myself as a leader mm-hmm. uh, in all these roles. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was seen as a fairly respected leader. People looked up to me. Uh, I was tough, but not nasty. Right? <laughs> I would get the work done. Okay. I would get the work done. I would delegate a lot. I would empower a lot. Okay. So a lot of my leadership learnings mm-hmm. actually came from the corporate experience. Like okay. How you can be effective uh, without. Without having to be nasty, yeah. Without having to be nasty or you know making life difficult for people, mm. carry them along, yeah, take them, them along, build them, show them the big picture, excite them. Mm. And I think to, even today, twenty years after leaving corporate, uh, many other guys have very fond memories of their experiences. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I think that gave me a lot of confidence, right? And uh, going back about thirteen years back, two thousand ten. I have a business partner mm-hmm. based in Delhi. His next colleague of mine from okay. Modi Zerocks. Well, from Modi Zerocks. Yeah, but he has more of finance and commercial um, background. Mine is more sales, marketing, sales. operations, A- HR, right. PNL. So, uh, so CNC is based out of Delhi. CNC, yeah, it's, it's registered in Delhi. Okay. CNC actually starts for stands for Chari and Cherian. Oh, okay. Yeah, my partner's name is Chari. Chari, Chari and Cherian. Chari and Cherian. And uh, CNC. C C N C. Okay. CNC. okay. We want to give our name to it. Oh, okay. We said, like, yeah, finally, we are the ones going to the market, okay. right? Right. And we use the word transcend because while I practice transcendental meditation for a lot of many years now, nice. and and uh, transcend is all, all all about going to the next level. Mm-hmm. It's all about going to the next, next level. level. So we said, C and C transcend management services, which sort of capture what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So you ask me how I got into this entrepreneurial journey yes, after corporate. Yes, from the so, that's a. That's a shift after a a quite shift. a long uh, a yeah. uh, you know stint in the corporate world yeah. so what what made that yeah so what was it we were in our early 50s then right we were in our early 50s then uh, and we said how long do we continue working for corporate right we've done we've done our innings now right? <laughs> 28 okay. 30 years he had also done about 30 years i had done about 28 years so about mm-hmm. we said between the two of us we got 60 years of experience mm-hmm. right? enough of gray hair mm-hmm. right enough of experience diverse experiences right so we said you know Or uh, can we do something on our own? Okay. And uh, so that is the first question: Can we do something on our own? Mm-hmm. Because giving up the comfort of a corporate job and you know, all the perks and everything right. else is not easy. Yes. Right? But we said, look, enough, enough of corporate life. Now I think we've done our bit. Mm-hmm. Now, how can we give back all these learnings and experience to people who can benefit from it? Sure. Mm-hmm. So that's how the journey started. So I think we started 2010. Uh, my partner is based in Delhi. I'm based in Bangalore. Was it a Almost immediate shift, or was there a gap or a break in the couple of months? Couple of months. Just for us to figure out what we want to do. Okay. And uh, those days we had only Skype, so you know we used to we used to have a call. Oh, okay. Every Monday evening we used to have a call on Skype and figure out okay, what has to be done, right? <laughs> All right. And uh, then we said, look, you know, with our 60 years experience, we have the option of going back to corporates mm-hmm. as consultants mm-hmm. and you know sharing our gyan with them, mm-hmm. right? But we said, who are the guys who can actually benefit? Because corporates have got senior leaders. They've got vice presidents. They've got senior vice presidents. They've got presidents. Sure. So uh, where do they really need us? Mm-hmm. Right. Where the guys who really need us could be the smaller enterprises. Right. So that's how the thinking got clarified. That look, let's focus on the small and medium enterprises, the SME sector. Uh, They have taken the plunge already into business, yeah. but do not have the know the probably the nuances of leadership yeah. and what it takes to. Yeah. run a organization successfully yeah okay so that was a very important decision that we will focus on the sme sector we will focus right. on family businesses we will focus okay. on startups that then also startups we were focusing on I see. anybody who is an entrepreneur mm. who is struggling to you know understand the best of corporate practices which can be brought into an entrepreneur can go for right mm-hmm. for us it comes naturally mm. right 
Sure. And uh, that's how we started off. So it was a uh, you know gamble, mm -hmm. uh, but we were very clear about one but thing. But it paid off. It paid off. But we were very clear about one thing. That look, you know, this is a choice that we are making. There's no going back to corporate. Oh, okay, great. Because if you had that escape route, chances yes. are you try it out for one or two years and say the money, the, the money is no longer yeah. the same as corporate. Let's go yeah. back to corporate. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So that was one important decision. That look, there's no going back. So was there a uh, uh, ramp up that happened in terms of the revenues to hit your corporate uh, level? No, or was it like we never even tried to match the corporate? Match the, okay. okay. So we said now this is give back time. Okay. So now this is give back time. We want to now give back our learnings and experiences, and we also realize that SMEs have got a limitation in terms of how much they can pay. Okay. Right? And they can't pay the kind so of. So you would uh, compensate to that. That would be. Okay. We are willing to compromise on our earnings, but we said we should enjoy what we do. And I think that right. was a, that was the starting point. Enjoy what you do. Yeah. I saw so that. Whatever it is. I say, saw that on the market. Right? <laughs> do what you love. Do what you love. <laughs> so yeah. we realized that giving back our learnings and experiences is what we loved. Okay. Right. Uh, along the way, we'll make money as well, but money was not the driving factor, right? While we were helping others scale up their business, we were not looking at how to scale up our business. Okay. That, that was never a consideration. Even today, it's not a consideration, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever happens, whatever comes, comes. That's it. Okay. So uh, that's how the journey started. And uh, since my partner was in Delhi, I was in Bangalore. We said, okay, you handle clients in Delhi, I'll handle clients in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. And if one of my clients needs a finance support, you pitch in. If any of your clients need sales support, I'll pitch in. Okay. Right? Because we had complementary skill sets. Okay. Right? And that's how so we started. What were the services that you started, uh, started with? Uh, See, we were not then clear. Then. We were not clear initially uh, how do we want to position ourselves. But we were very clear that we don't want to go as consultants. Okay. Because I had figured out somewhere along the way that <laughs> a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs, I started attending a few networking meetings in Thai and other places, ah, okay. right? right. I f uh, figured out that a lot of entrepreneurs have had not so pleasant experiences with consultants. Okay. Uh, you know, come and give a lot of gyan and say, mm. you should do this, you should do that, and leave it and go. So not execution, no. focus, not execution yeah, focus. Not execution right? focus. There's no <coughs> accountability yeah. that in the solutions or yeah. services that they think. Yeah, okay. So uh, at that stage, I got introduced to an organization called Mentor Square. Uh, Mentor Square was set up I think in 2011-12 very soon after I, we, are, we also started our journey and they started having this concept of having mentors for the entrepreneur segment mm -hmm. uh, but specific mentors focusing on specific areas mentor for business mentor for HR okay. mentor for you know uh, manufacturing that way right? mm -hmm. so I got associated with them <coughs> and in the process uh, I worked with a couple of clients as a mentor okay but then we realize mentoring is possibly what we are really doing. Mm -hmm. you know, we are not just giving advice, but we are actually mm -hmm. figuring out <clears throat> where the person is stuck and what they need to do to get to the next level. Right? Okay. So our prime thing was that we should help entrepreneurs scale up their business. Scale up their business mm -hmm. and professionalize the way of working. Okay. Work in a structured, process-driven, professional way, the way corporates run. They could be smaller organization, but they can still run in that way. Sure. But they were not aware of how that thing works. Okay. Right? Okay. That is where we brought in our corporate experiences okay. right, to a large extent. Okay. <clears throat> so we started off like that. And you know, my first client was a manufacturing client. I never worked in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. My second client was into IT, ERP. Mm -hmm. The third one was into education, healthcare. So in the first Every year, industry. first year we figured out that look, you know, we don't need to be industry specialists. We don't need to be industry specialist because we are not uh, going there as an industry specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you are in healthcare or education or IT or manufacturing, you want to grow your business. So we are, we are business specialists. Mm -hmm. So as business mentors, we were business specialists and not functional specialists. Okay. And I think that is where it, by the end of the first year, uh, we also figured out that business mentoring seems to be the best path forward. And that's how we need to position ourselves in the market. <clears throat> so that's how we started off. And uh, that journey went on for a couple of years where we focused only on the SME sector, doing only business mentoring. And a very satisfying experience because, you know, every case we were able to make a change in the way the entrepreneur thinks. So we were able to challenge them. We were able to tell them, look, you have a problem, right? You better change your style. Otherwise, uh, the problem is not in the team, the problem is with you. Now, that is something we could do. Uh, which, uh, because of our seniority, they took us seriously. Okay. Right. Okay. 
so sometimes gray hair helps you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, they take us seriously because we are saying it after observing them for a couple okay. of months we're not right in the beginning we observe okay. them how they manage the people how they manage the teams how they take decisions and but then we sort of figure out look you know uh, the way you're going about hiring the way you're going about firing the way you're going about uh, choosing people and you know managing people this is not going to result in your business to grow at all right if you want to grow the business, do things the way we think it has to be done. Sure. Then yeah. they started looking at us with respect. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, we are part of that. We are going to guide them on how to get there. Right? Yeah. So it's not just about giving a promise, but actually you know, being part of the journey. Being part of the journey. Yeah. So the business mentoring thing went off very well mm-hmm. for the first five years. Um, variety of clients, variety of segments. And uh, about five years down the road, uh, we also realized that, no, I realized that quite often the bottleneck are the leaders mm. in the organization, right? Is that a pattern that you see in the SME and the Very much, entrepreneur? Okay. very much. The leader yeah. or the founder? Founder, founder, the, co-founders. They become the bottleneck. They become the bottleneck, right? What are the typical practices or leadership styles that actually, uh, you know, stunts the growth and the scale story for them? What, what, what do you see in these? From your experience, what do these founders do in the small and SME sector that stunts or that uh, you know uh, constricts the growth uh, that they're looking for? From your observation, what, what I think the doing? fundamental problem is the way they manage people. People manage. So I always say the top three challenges I've seen in SMEs are people, people, people. <laughs> okay. Top three challenges because. You have the right person the wrong job or the wrong person the right job, mm-hmm. right? You're not going to get the results, right? You don't manage them properly. You don't empower them properly. You don't trust them enough. You want to micromanage every small uh, decision. Mm-hmm. You don't give them the empowerment to take decisions. And then you say, look, they're not doing a good job. Mm-hmm. The tendency is to blame the team the when the business does not scale up. Mm-hmm. So people do the planning what what kind of targets are we aiming for this year what kind of growth every entrepreneur wants 50 percent growth 60 percent growth so it doesn't happen it's not so easy and right? is that expectation across yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You've seen? So most people want that kind of rapid growth mm-hmm. but they don't realize the team below is not ready for that kind of growth mm-hmm. uh, given targets they take it they achieve 50 percent of it 60 percent of it mm-hmm. right and then the entrepreneur gets into the feeling that look you know you know the team is not uh, shaping up shaping. So I had this experience with a manufacturing firm, uh, SME. Mm-hmm. Uh, that time they were about 20, 25 crores. Yeah. Uh, and I observed in the first three months that I was working with them that, uh, you know, they were hiring people, training people, losing people. Hiring, training, losing. Hiring, training, losing. Mm-hmm. So finally I asked him, are you a manufacturing company or are you a hiring company? <laughs> all, all you seem to be doing is hiring, hiring. and firing, yeah. right? Have you even tried to quantify what are the business impact of each time you hire somebody mm-hmm. and then you train the person for two months and then the person leaves in three months, right? You got no productivity out of that person. You spend money, but you got nothing out of that person, right? Again, you're hiring. Is this uh, firing or the, was it the firing or was the, the employee was leaving? Both, of his own both, place? both. So firing. Is this typical of this particular industry? See, employees is leaving on their own. Here again, I must make a distinction there. I mean, uh, now that I've been into this for the last 13 years, right? There are two types of entrepreneurs, right? One is where the employees don't leave at all. And one is where the employees don't stay at all. Okay. Okay. And it has a lot to do with the culture of their organization. Okay. I know a lot of family businesses where people have been working with that company for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. They are wedded to the entrepreneur. So there, there some of the entrepreneurs are extremely good at looking after the people, mm-hmm. but they still struggle on growth, right? Mm-hmm. The, the people get very comfortable uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, they are very comfortable. So then there's not that extra drive and push to stretch themselves, try something different, you know, try something innovative. That is one extreme. The other extreme is where, you know, every three months, four months, either people are leaving on their own because the culture sucks or, you know, they are being found, you know, not right mm-hmm. and they're being asked to go. Right. Okay. So both. Okay. So I wouldn't say it's a universal problem. I think it, there are there are both the extremes of. Uh, Do you feel that there is something called as a, um, a healthy attrition rate, and uh, uh, there, there, it, it also so there is a counter view that I hear from many organizations today that 
we would love for people with newer minds and newer ideas to be flowing and that happens when we hire new people. Yeah. So what do you think about organizations that pride themselves on having uh, you know, single digit attrition rates less than five? Uh, is that healthy? Is it does it work, or do you you know recommend that there be a fresh infusion of ideas and uh, workforce um, irrespective of the industry? Yeah. What do you? I think there should there should be a fresh infusion because as the company is going through different stages. So I can give you an example where this was a manufacturing company, right? They were largely dealing with the domestic market, dealing with the domestic market and dealing with distributors and retailers and stuff like that. So they had people who were handling that part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as they started looking at expanding and as we were looking at a business plan and where are the opportunities and where they can expand and uh, today this year they're touching 100 crores. They were mm -hmm. 20 crores a uh, okay. few years back. So they realized they had to get into exports, mm -hmm. right? They realized they had to get into e-commerce. Okay. They realized they had to get into modern trade, you know? And uh, there was nobody in the organization who had that kind of skill set, right? Okay. They also realized that they had to hire now people from the industry at much, much higher salaries right. than the existing team was at. Okay. So that was a stumbling block. That you know, if you bring in these three people at you know 70%, 80% higher salaries and people are there, it's going to create a lot of turbulence. True. Right? So those are the areas where the entrepreneurs get stuck. Yeah, so I was talking about you know where the entrepreneurs get stuck because on their own they hesitate to take these uh, decisions That's which they think might impact the rest of the team members, right? Mm -hmm. So in trying to protect the team members, actually hurting the organization, mm -hmm. right? So this is where, as a business mentor, we come in, right? Okay. We said, look, if you want to scale up your business on 20 crores to 40 crores to 60 crores to 100 crores, mm -hmm. uh, will your current team take you there? Okay, right. right. Uh, will your, does your current team have even the capability to take you there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then they realize, no. Mm -hmm. They said, then we need ex uh, external talent, right? How are we going to attract external talent? How do we want people to come and join a small medium firm <coughs> from a larger, you know, kind of a role that they've had? Yeah. <coughs> so you've got to pay the kind of salaries that they would expect. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where, you know, we help to define the org structure. Mm -hmm. We said, look, if you want to scale up the org structure of next year, it's be very different from the org structure of this year. What kind of senior level roles are you bringing in? Right. You need a general manager sales or you need a you know uh, vice president marketing or all of that. But those are things they're not used to. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, so uh, once we have defined the Structured structure, hierarchy, hierarchy, hierarchy. hierarchy. Okay. Uh, also quite often we help them to structure the business division wise. Mm -hmm. Right. So there could be different business units within the business, but all treated as one. So we bring in that business unit concept. Uh, with each business unit becoming a PNL by itself. Again, a new concept mm -hmm. for them. They look at PNL at the overall level. Overall level, yeah? right. Whereas I said I want to see PNL at the business level. Yeah, so the importance of PNL at the business level is that, you know, it, it's quite an eye opener for mm -hmm. many of the entrepreneurs themselves. They never look at it that way. Right. And suddenly we realize that there are certain business units that are losing money. Mm -hmm. There are certain geographies that are losing money. There are certain product categories that are losing money. And I keep asking them, why the hell are you taking so much trouble? To lose money. Right? <laughs> why, why take so much trouble to hire people, manage people, and then finally lose money? Right. So, I've always spoken about when we're looking at growth, mm. you must look at profitable revenue growth and right. not just revenue growth. Right. right. Profitable revenue yeah. growth. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you don't make profit, how are you going to reinvest back in the business for growth? Right. How are you going to hire the right people? How are you going to spend on marketing and branding? How are you going to spend on Know, all the other decisions that you need to take, investments that you need to make to grow the business, new office, technology, etc. Now, if you are squeezed on profit, then you're going to keep compromising on your decisions, right? Okay. And it's, it's a negative cycle. It's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. You never get out of it. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, this again has been an eye opener for many entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. uh, they start looking at you know, some geographies actually losing money and they didn't even realize it for the last couple of years they're losing money there. Mm -hmm. So I give them an ultimatum. Okay. In the next six months, either we make those locations or profit uh, categories profitable, or we get out of it. Okay. Now, see, as a mentor, I can uh, put my foot down mm -hmm. because then I've observed the client for about six months, right? Right. And uh, they take, they know what I'm saying is right. 
Correct. It's back to and you bring that neutral perspective. Yeah, because I'm, so, I'm, a, I'm a very data-oriented person, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all based on facts and figures, not bits and fancies. Right. Look, your data is showing this. Your mm -hmm. finance person is saying this now. Mm -hmm. Now you take a call, what do you want? Okay. okay. So I think that is, a, again, a change of mindset. Mm -hmm. That uh, I think a, a lot of the mentoring is a mindset uh, game. Have you... Uh, felt the resistance to this approach from any of your clients? Do they resist the kind of insights or the change requirements that come with, you know, this uh, this growth stage? Have, have has any of the uh, business owners resisted the change that they need to make? Not the business owners, some of the team members. Team members, okay. Business owners obviously have hired me because they know they, they, they know they're stuck, okay. and they want to get unstuck. They mm -hmm. want the experience, right? Mm -hmm. So they position us. Okay, CK sir is coming now. You know, he's going to ask a lot of questions. Better be prepared. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the teams are not prepared for that kind of intensive interrogation, right? What about this? What about so you have always have some that one person in the team who will resist who, that. Who will resist that. Particular people who've been in the company for some time, they've been used to a particular way of working. They have a mm -hmm. comfort level with the owner. Right. And then the comfort <coughs> level. Then CK comes in. I call in it the bean bag zone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> CK comes in and disrupts, <laughs> like, you know, total disruption. Right. Okay. So I also use the word constructive disruption. Construct. Okay. Business mentoring is all about disruption. Yeah. You have to disrupt the way of working. Right. In a constructive way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so look, now let's do things differently mm -hmm. and do it in a planned and structured manner. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, business owners are very open. They, okay. Because they know they need the help, right? Right. Uh, with some of the team members, I have to be very tough. Mm -hmm. I have to be very tough. And that's where my corporate experience comes in. I'm very cold. Okay. <laughs> okay. I've told people, some of the team members, look, if you've not come prepared for the meeting, mm -hmm. don't waste your time, don't waste my time. You come okay. back next week, prepare. Okay. You know, the, the owners don't talk that way to the people because they're scared they lose them. Mm -hmm. So I tell the owner, are you okay to lose this guy? Mm. Oh, okay. Because if, yeah, if he doesn't change, better to lose him. Right. So sometimes right. we force attrition. So it's ha ha. We force attrition mm. when we find that people are constantly resisting change. Which is beneficial for the organization. Beneficial for the organization, right. Mm. So then even the owners say, oh, yeah, okay, fine, let this guy go. If he goes, he goes, you know, we'll uh, manage it. Right? Mm. So. Those are the shifts that we keep on having during the journey of conversation. Okay. okay. So, uh, talking a little more about growth, you, you talked about growth, uh, profitable growth. Uh, you know, a couple of times you mentioned about it. Now, uh, uh, I have a couple of questions here. Sure. Um, I wrote a book recently about growth, right? Growing and scaling an organization, growth especially scripture. the growth scripture. So, in that, I talk about some of the uh, nitty gritties of what it takes to grow an organization, what it takes to scale an organization, far away from the current, uh, you know, the, uh, some of the startup narratives that are there ar around growth, right? Uh, so, from that perspective, I have a question in terms of the strategies for growth, right? What are the common pitfalls that you have seen? in terms of the businesses uh, during the, especially given the current scenario of how, uh, you know, uh, businesses run, uh, they go in for funding and uh, external, uh, rev you know, uh, sources of funding. What is your, um, you know, um, insight that you can share with businesses on what they should do when they're growing an organization and not fall into the trap of uh, you know looking for this fast uh, paced growth uh, but create that sustainable growth story what what advice do you have what are the pitfalls first of all and what advice do you have to not fall into those kind of traps because today everybody is looking at the funding story and the funding success right that's 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 the strong narrative that has been built uh, by the media and the startup ecosystem. Not that all of them are bad, but uh, many people sure. fall into that funding trap and they lose the focus on what is the purpose with which they had started their organization. Sure. So what are these strategies for growth that you recommend? And what are those pitfalls where, or traps where you uh, suggest or where you advise uh, uh, the businesses not to get into? See, I think there are two categories of entrepreneurs. One are the <coughs> small and medium enterprises, the family businesses, which are more traditional in their approach, right? Mm -hmm. They are not depending on external funding. They're typically going for the bank funding and, you know, and they, they manage their cash flow and they manage their growth. A lot of my work has been in that area, right? So there it's a very steady scale up of growth. Mm -hmm. right? And even a couple of my clients, they have wanted to get an external investor. Mm -hmm. and. 
I have asked him, are you sure? Okay. Are you really sure? This is a family business you have created over the last 20 years. Right. Are you really clear that you want somebody to bring in money and then tell you what you sh how you should run your business? Mm -hmm. They would tell you how to scale up, where to scale up. Correct. Eventually, you will become like a COO of that company. You will no longer be the owner <laughs> of the company. Right. So I've cautioned them. Then. Okay. Look, you know, do you want steady, profitable growth or do you want rapid growth with loss of control? Mm -hmm. Take a choice. Mm -hmm. So again, I put that doubt in their mind. Take a choice. Okay. If you still want that, great. Okay. All right. But and does your advice to them change based on their choice? It would, right? Yeah, it would, it would. But I'm saying that many of them say that, look, you know, okay, we'd much rather go the steady way, okay. right? But but let us look how we can increase our profit. Let okay. us increase how we can top line and bottom line mm -hmm. so that we are growing at a rate where we as entrepreneurs feel happy, our employees feel happy, and our customers and everybody are happy, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the entrepreneurs fall into that category. Okay. So they're not uh, super adventurous. Okay. They're not looking okay. at rapid scale up. Right? Okay. 20 crores to 100 crores in four years, five years is okay with that. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the more the startup ecosystem, which is more driven by valuations. Yes. Right. There yes. the entire focus is on rapid scale up. Correct. Yes. And that entire rapid scale up is driven by investor money. Mm -hmm. Right. Not necessarily by a good business model. Mm -hmm. Cash burns. Yeah, so it's only cash burn because it's somebody else's money which is being burned. Right. right. Uh, I have never been in favor of that. I think, look, yeah. you know, I think end of the day, as long as that funds keep coming, mm -hmm. you keep growing. Right. right. You keep hiring people. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way, uh, the investor is going to ask for bottom line. True. And when the bottom line does not happen, the investors start calling the shots. Yes. Cut down manpower, you know, restructure. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> So you're seeing the amount of layoffs that have been happening in the startup ecosystem. Yes. Just because of the greed to mm -hmm. scale up rapidly and uh, focus on valuations. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's a, uh, a mod model that I would recommend. Some, mm -hmm. some of the companies have done very well, mm -hmm. right? But I think there are more people which are falling by the wayside than people who are succeeding. True. Right? And you're playing with the lives of employees. You're playing with the lives of employees. You're taking them into these startups with a big vision, yeah. uh, assuming that the funds will keep coming. Mm -hmm. And when the funds dry up, then you know what happens. So. Right. I am more in favor of the steady, sustainable, mm -hmm. profitable, profitable focus mm -hmm. so that the, the organization is able to achieve its goals, achieve its visions mm -hmm. in line with what the entrepreneur needs. Sure. So the okay. entrepreneur still remains the boss. Mm -hmm. In a funded firm, the entrepreneur is not the boss. Not the boss. And I think to right. me that's a big difference. It's your firm. Why is somebody else? Your idea. Why is somebody right. else controlling how you should do, what you should do, where you should expand? Mm -hmm. You know, then then you're like an employee, right? right? So I, I always advise entrepreneurs: you take that call. Do you want to be the owner or do you want to be? Uh, What's somebody? been the percentage out of curiosity of people who have said no, no, no? We want to be the owner. We want to retain the country. No, most of them. Most of them. Choose. Most of them. Most of them. They choose to be the. Control it's, I think it's only the new age uh, startups mm -hmm. that are driven by that urge for quick scale quick up and quick valuation. Okay. Uh, I don't, I, frankly, I don't do much work in that area. I don't, okay. I don't work in that domain Space. very much. Mm -hmm. I used to work with startups in the initial stage and we realized that that's not so exciting. Right. Oh, so okay. Exciting. okay. As a mentor, I don't get the kick. <laughs> because mm -hmm. some of the decisions that get forced mm. are not which I think is also good for the business. Okay. Right. okay. So I've been involved in a couple of startups. Mm. There was funding that came in, there were two co-founders, then, mm. then the funding dried up, mm. then there was a fallout between the co-founders, the mm. firm just closed down. Oh, okay. Right. So I spent a year with that organization, but then the firm closed down because funding stopped. Mm -hmm. and, they, they, and they were not able to generate the... They were not able to have a sustainable, sustainable business model. See, for me, sustainable business model okay. is, is, the, the is the key. Is the key. Okay. Sustainable business sustainable. model, not just about revenue. Right. It's, it's not a numbers game. Right. Yes, okay. sure. Mm -hmm. So many of these startups actually focus on numbers and scale. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you ask me, I think between rapid scale up and steady scale up, I am more uh, more in favor of. Maybe I'm slightly old fashioned, mm -hmm. but I'm more in favor of a steady steady scale up, which is more long term mm -hmm. and more sustainable and good for the owners, good for the employees, good for the organization. You also mentioned Cherian about the people aspect. Uh, you said it's people, people, and people. Now, the focus on people who form the core of an, an organization is not four walls, yeah. right? It is the people it's who make people. an organization. In uh, Given that uh, premise, that foundation, that people are 
what make an organization successful or not. Uh, what, where do you see the technology and innovation and this AI, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, um, coming into the whole uh, play of running an organization, automation, and all that? Where do you see the people factor? Uh, getting relegated to, or do you still feel with the AI coming in st and the technology uh, advances that are happening, people will still be the number one uh, challenge, issue, focus area for uh, entrepreneurs, especially in the SME segment. What, uh, where do you see the technology, innovation, AI, and stuff like this uh, having their say in this decision making process? Yeah. To, to me, technology is always an enabler. It's, it's not the replacement. Mm. It's the enabler. Basically, so if you want to improve your productivity, you know, you find that you have a lot of people not being used productively you know, and not getting the kind of output that they want, then using technology tools to improve that productivity makes a lot of sense, right? So you keep your organization lean, okay. right? You have the right uh, optimum manpower, mm. and instead of you know having a lot of manpower, you have optimum manpower complemented by the use of AI and technology to support that, right? So, so that you can again get back to the fact that uh, the combination of people and technology has to deliver the end results that we want. So the outcome has to still be the focus yeah, area. Yeah. What I hear from you is, is that, is that um, there will be technology, there will be technological advancements, uh, automation, enablement, etc. But uh, it is a sweet spot of where you uh, you know, bring in the technology, and still, what is the cultural elements of how you manage people? That will always be your focus area. True, true. Whether it's ten employees or five employees, you you, you really need to have that performance, that that culture. Performance culture. Come on. So, for yeah. example, a lot of the SME, uh, they have these trackers for sales, for business, for marketing, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. Initially, many of these itself are not being done properly. Mm -hmm. So even having a CRM, there are a lot of people who've got CRMs, they've got Salesforce, they don't use it. Mm -hmm. They've invested in the technology, yes. but the teams are not using it, or they're using it very sketchily. Okay. Right? So oh, I said, what's, why is that? Is it because of lack of training or lack of buy-in? Comf comfort. 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 Okay. Training is generally done by the company that provides the CRM. Sure. But so I said, first, first get your basic discipline of the fact that data is important. Mm. Analytics is important. Business mm. analytics is important, and those analytics will only come from these kind of uh, way of working, mm. right? Now, if that that becomes a way of working, then transiting to a technology-enabled thing becomes much easier. Just investing in technology without the cultural part, mm. I think the technology does not get used. True. So I think the two have to go hand in hand. The, the importance of people, I think, will always uh, be key. Yeah. Right. How do you? Uh, advise businesses on how they need to measure their success. What is the criteria? You said you're very data driven. So what is the criteria for how you measure the success of the movement of an organization from a point, uh, say a point A to point B? I think one is to define the goals <clears throat> that uh, I'm, a, I'm a 20 crore company. Uh, in 20 years I've reached 20 crores. In the next three years I want to reach 60 crores. Mm -hmm. That's the goal, okay, business okay. goal. I want to get from there. But how is that going to happen? Mm. Who is going to make it happen? Mm. What are the goals within that which are going to deliver that, right? So I think a lot of thing comes from accountability. Okay. Creating accountability in terms of who in the team is going to take what responsibility and going to be accountable for what. That's where data comes in, right? right. So you clearly define metrics for each person, mm. for each role. How are you going to measure after sales service or sales or marketing that okay so much money has gone in, what are the kind of improvement in the numbers between uh, one quarter and the next quarter, one quarter and the next quarter, that way. Pure outcome oriented. Outcome oriented but driven by uh, you know how you go about it. Right. So the style of doing it is very important. So I've had clients, you know, where they get a lot of inquiries because they've been in the business for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when I start asking them in terms of how many of your inquiries are actually converting into orders, mm -hmm. initially they don't have the data. I, oh, said, okay. I said, next week, uh, please give me the data when I come. Okay. Then they say 20% conversion. Okay. So my first question is, why are we losing 80%? And they never thought about it. <laughs> right? So sometimes, right. sometimes very simple questions, but get them to think, oh, we never thought about this. Right. right? 
And some of them say that's the industry standard. No, I said no. So now you uh, look at your 80%, mm -hmm. right? Look at all the places where you have submitted a proposal or a quotation, which mm -hmm. you have lost. Mm -hmm. right? And can you just let me know, that, uh, analyze the reasons for the loss? Okay. Initially, they all say, oh, we lost because of the price. Mm. But when we force them to start analyzing the data and slicing and dicing it more and more, mm -hmm. they realize that a lot of the order losses are because they have not covered the market well, they have not responded to the customer on time. Mm. Pricing is also a factor. Okay. A factor. But I said, look, you know, if you have 20% conversion, can go to 40% conversion. Just imagine. Mm. Right? That's straight away a doubling of business. Correct. Because people are anywhere reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. You're not doing justice to them. Yes. Sometimes even a very simple metrics like that, you know, improve what will it take to improve conversion ratio on 20 to 30 or 20 to 40 percent in the next three months or six months. Mm -hmm. Set a reasonable time frame. Okay. So I'm always very particular about setting reasonable time frames. Right? Sure. That you know change does not happen in a jiffy. It takes mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. right? So if you say that okay, this is my goal. I want to improve my business conversion to this percentage, but I need to be able to measure it month on month. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to share it month on month. Mm -hmm. I need to understand the root causes for it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what is contributing to it, and what are the corrective actions. Mm -hmm. So I always come up with a four quadrant kind of a document which I share with my, okay. which which sort of breaks down this whole performance thing into the ridiculities. Yeah, it's about where are we performing. So I think the area where most entrepreneurs miss out is that they are so busy with their day-to-day -day firefighting, mm -hmm. with their day-to-day -day operations. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't invest that time in actually uh, diving deep into the data. Mm -hmm. They're only worried about the end result. Okay, this year, this month we were supposed to do five crores, we've done only three crores. Mm -hmm. What is happening? They put mm -hmm. pressure on the team. Okay. Without analyzing why, why it's not happening, yeah. or uh, what is working well, what is not working well. So every business review that I do, which I go once a week or once a fortnight to my clients, it's all about what is working well, what is not working well. And if it's not working well, why is why it Why it's not working well. So a lot of this four quadrant or the, I use another GSA format, goal, strategy, action, mm -hmm. timelines, measures. Mm -hmm. but, so any goal that is taken, business goal, mm -hmm. uh, the team has to define where do they think they are today. Okay. On a scale of 100, okay. 30 percent or 40%. They themselves acknowledge that they are 30, 40 percent today. Mm -hmm. In the next six months, where would you like to be? We would like sure. to be at a 60 or 70 percent, right? All right? What will it take for that to happen? So every so work backwards. Yeah, every goal is broken down into two or three strategies. Each mm -hmm. strategy is broken down into two or three actions. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be responsible for that action? What mm -hmm. is the timeline? How are you going to measure it? So you actually define the action plan. The responsibilities the and the measures. Measures. Yeah, measures. So this is a typical way a corporate would work. It's right. not the way an entrepreneur works. So yeah. I always say that you know, for an entrepreneur to be on a growth path, mm. it's a marriage between an entrepreneurial way of working yeah. and a corporate, corporate way. way of How to get the best mix? Okay. So I think our role is to ensure that uh, we continue the entrepreneurial way of thinking and risk taking and all the other things that entrepreneurs are good for mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but bring in all these reviews structures processes policies measures right everything has to be measured i think if it's not measured how do you know whether you're getting to your destination or not true so i think so that's is, the fundamental yeah. philosophy of okrs as well yeah, measure yeah. what matters measure what matters first define what matters define what matters and then, then measure, measure what are those metrics for each function yeah each and function. what i've also seen is many times people struggle with the what matters what also matters. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I think that's where a business mentor like you comes into the picture. You first help them identify what matters, what matters. and then uh, you know define uh, the measures and uh, uh, the you know the pathway, the action plan, etc., and the responsibilities. So yeah. So one of the things I do, Deepa, is uh, when I start with a new client, quite likely I don't know much about the client. It could be a new industry. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I do something called a business health scan. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like a typical health scan where we go and f figure out, okay, everything is okay, right. okay, but your BP is not okay, or your sugar is not okay, this is not mm -hmm. okay. So this health scan is done with the entire leadership team, mm -hmm. the core leadership team, okay, uh, the CEO, founder, and the other department. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. So again, they acknowledge that look on this particular parameter, it could be in terms of sales operations, it could be in terms of marketing and branding, it could be in terms of market coverage, it could be in terms of HR and people. So the business health scan has got seven elements mm. uh, which I have designed. Okay. And uh, each one they give a rating. Okay, we are at 40% okay. on this, we are at 60% on okay, this. Okay, it's on a, uh, a percentile scale. Percentile scale okay. as per them. Uh, okay, right? as per them. I think that is the first 
step, step to change. Oh, okay. They are acknowledging that look, we are not where we need to be. How, how realistic are they in this assessment? So what I do is I, I get each one to send it to me individually. Okay. So it's, it's not done collectively. I okay. get the CEO, the COO, the mm. departmental heads to send in on a scale of 10 or 100. Where do they think they are they on this stand. particular question, mm. right? And then I compile it all together and say, this is the range of scores that I'm getting, mm. right? On some parameters, the CEO thinks we are 2 on 10, mm. but the team leader thinks we are 7 on 10. Oh, okay. Why? <laughs> I said, how can there be That's so the much big, of a yeah. yeah? I said, how can there be so much of a difference? Mm. So people are trying to defend that turf. Think that mm -hmm. look, in our area, things are going fine. Mm. Right? Whereas the CEO thinks things are not going fine, which is why. But at the end of the day, it, the, what CEO thinks is what matters, right? Both, in both. Terms of, so okay. we are able to power. flash it out. So I, okay. and I share that entire document, saying that look, mm. two, three, seven, eight. Uh, so usually who wins that battle? The CEO score or the team member score? I win the battle. <laughs> 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 I said, look, you can't have such a diversity in the opinions. Right. Uh, there must be a justification. Let's agree on what, where do we collectively now as a team think we are. Mm -hmm. So I think a large portion of the success of uh, business mentoring is you start involving the entire leadership team. It's not a one-man intervention. Okay. okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So they also start learning. They also mm -hmm. start growing. Mm -hmm. They get exposed to new ways of doing things. Okay. They get exposed to new templates, okay. how to look at data, how okay. to review their teams, okay. right? uh, and also you know where they need support, where they need training. So I think it's the organization has to be built bottom up. Right. Numbers is the end result. Correct. Quite often the focus is on the numbers. Numbers. True. Whereas I start focus from the bottom. Yes. Where are we? The today? building blocks. Yeah. Where are yeah. we today? Where do we want to want be? Want to be. Mm. Uh, and what is going to make us get there? What are the things we need to do differently? So I always say, no, uh, new ways of doing old things. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Mm -hmm. We're doing things in a particular way that's working up to a point. But now if you want to go to the next level, uh, that will not be enough. You have to do something different, something innovative, something new. And uh, I extract most of the ideas from them because they are the experts in the industry, not me. Right. right. So, uh, Chetan, you've been in the industry for so long, corporate as well as your you know, business coaching and mentoring experience. What is that one thing that you would like to differentiate uh, between mentoring, coaching and consulting? And the reason I ask this is many times this is looked upon as business leaders as interchangeable uh, or interoperable. I'm sure there's uh, technically a difference uh, is, between yes. these three. If you can throw some light on sure, that. Sure. So I think and what should business leaders do? In what scenario they should go in for mentoring, for coaching and consulting? So for example, uh, if there's a manufacturing company or an IT company, mm. or a, you know, then it's always good to have somebody who comes with that domain expertise. Mm. So you could have an HR consultant, you could have an IT consultant, you could have a manufacturing consultant. Mm. Because they have worked in that domain for 20, 30 years, so they're experts in that domain. Mm. So they are able to come and identify quickly what are the gaps mm. and what are the corrective actions. Right? And give that as a report to the thing. And look, these are the recommended changes that we do. Mm -hmm. But typically, consultants would be functional experts. Okay. Uh, hmm. A particular area of this thing. Coaching is focused more, mostly on the individual. individual. Right. So, for instance, if I find that the COO is a bottleneck, hmm. and he or she needs to change their leadership style, hmm. right? Then, a one-on-one -on -one coaching with that individual okay. can help that person reflect: What am I doing right? What am I not doing right? Okay. Uh, and the coach can guide them in terms of what are your goals, uh, professional goals that you want to focus on, could be your personal goals that you want to focus on, you're not getting work-life balance, mm -hmm. you're working 14 hours a day, mm -hmm. and you're stressed out. Okay. So coaching focuses on the individual. Okay. And typically a coach is not supposed to give answers, is not supposed to give solutions. Mm -hmm. Coach is supposed to ask questions okay. and get the other person to reflect Okay. On, okay, maybe I could try this one out differently. Mm -hmm. The coach is like this, asking the questions to get the uh, ideas out from the coaching. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, coaching is uh, not telling. Coaching is not uh, sharing your experiences. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, business mentoring, which I call business mentoring, is where you share your experiences. Okay. Right. So, then 
all my 30 years of experience in sales, marketing, product management, project management, mm. all comes in useful. The moment I find that a client is getting stuck on a particular area on project management, right? mm -hmm. they're not their customer experience is getting affected because the project management process is not okay. okay. I'm able to straight away say, look, have you thought about trying it this way? Mm. Have you looked at this template? I can suggest a template for you. Mm. So a mentor is very uh, giving. Okay. Giving uh, based on their learnings and experience and what they think is the most appropriate. Uh, Given that scenario. Yeah. And a mentor typically would not be confined to one function. Okay. I'm looking at the whole organization. Okay. Okay. organization. So it will cover HR. I mean that's where all the functional experience that yeah. you bring in. Sales, marketing, in. HR, that comes into play. Yeah. Because if an organization has to scale up and double up in the next uh, two, year, two to three years, right? Every function has got played its role. Yeah, yeah. Uh, finance, yes. HR, yes. Uh, after sales service, customer mm. experience, mm. you know, uh, sales, marketing. Each function will have to step up. Yeah. And because a business mentor comes with a diverse experience, mm. right, they're able to handle any function. Okay. So quite often when I go to a client, you know, my sessions are from 10.30 in the morning till 6.30 in the evening, okay. eight okay. hours, okay. Uh, with each team separately. Mm. You know. Mm. A consultant may not do that, a mm. coach may not do that, mm. a, a business mentor because okay. he is looking at the business holistically right? and the uh, owner is looking at the business mentor as the you know, saviour. Right. Uh, it's a bottom up lifting of the business and the team. Okay. Fundamentally these are the differences. So consulting is subject specific, uh, coaching is more focused on the individual and getting the best out of the individual and mentoring is more uh, holistic. Holistic business. approach. Right. There's also group coaching. For instance, if you if I want to get the leaders mm. to reflect on you know what can we do differently next year. Maybe leadership styles. Yeah. So, also so that's where the leadership facilitation, facilitation comes in. So a lot of my leadership facilitation is in a way group coaching. Okay. Then okay. also I'm not giving the solutions, mm. I'm getting them to reflect. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I've done a couple of sessions recently on vision to reality. Vision to reality. reality. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Every organization got a fancy vision, mm. but most of them don't achieve it. Right? True. Most, most of the leaders don't even know what the vision is. Right, right, right. So in this vision to reality session, it's like a group coaching where we get them to reflect in terms of if this is the vision of the founder, mm. what is holding us back? What can we do differently? Okay. So there again, the answers are being drawn from them based on their experience. So that's group right. coaching. So coaching can be individual or All it can group. be at a group. Right? Okay. I have some uh, rapid fire uh, <laughs> questions for you sure. on some non uh, mentoring and coaching non related <laughs> to get to know you better sure. as a person. And of course, then I would love for you to share some parting thoughts with the audience. Sure. Uh, but before that, what's your favorite food? Favorite food? I'm not much of a foodie. <laughs> okay. So I, what do you eat I, when? I eat as much as I need to survive. So I'm okay. a very, very small eater. Okay. Uh, I like good food. Okay. But, uh, yeah, Any nice. particular cuisine you prefer over the others? I'm quite happy with it, uh, anything. I have no anything. Indian, Chinese, oh, uh, okay. continental. So right. pretty okay with any kind of. Having lived in different uh, geographies, hmm. I think food has been pretty universal. Okay. Who's your favorite singer? Favorite singer? Hmm. I have so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> first person who comes to your mind. First person that comes to my mind. I think I like uh, Eric Clapton. Okay. Yeah, I like Pink the Floyd. Pink Floyd. Uh, right. I, Favorite song in that Mostly, case? mostly, you know, I grew up on the 70s and 80s music, mm -hmm. the retro music. So right. even today, uh, when I listen to music, it's more that genre uh, than, right. than the current uh, kind of stuff. So, so which I, is your favorite song in, from that? Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Dark Side of the Moon, okay. Yeah, I like that. Because we, listen we listened to all that in college, right? So we, grew, <laughs> we grew up on that. Right. And uh, even now, uh, we love to listen to that kind of music. It's a retro rock uh, kind of music that I typically Right, prefer. okay. What about your favorite destination? Holiday destination. If you were to choose one, which would you choose? It could be within India or even outside the country. I quite like uh, Kurk. Kurk? Yeah. In fact, uh, having done most of the foreign countries earlier mm. in the corporate stint, mm. I think the last 10 years, 
we've been focusing as a family entirely on Indian destinations. Okay. Really, there's so much to see here. So much to see. So India. much to see yeah. here. So every every three months, we sort of take a break. Okay. Go somewhere. Go to go go to Chikmagalur. Go to uh, we're going to Bonar in January. Okay. So okay. I think that's enough to explore here itself. In this country. And I think yes. I think the fascination for foreign locales has gone. I think that True. stage is over. Yeah. Right. There's so much to explore in India. And we're quite happy doing that. Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite movie if you have one? Which probably you watched more than once. Any such movie? No, I watch only once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't. I don't think I watch any movie more than. More once. than once. Okay. So any favorite movie which comes to your mind? Mm. I think I like again. My my taste is more the retro kind of movies. Mm -hmm. so sure. I think Godfather mm -hmm. was one. Godfather, okay. I think powerful acting, the class, yeah, powerful yeah. acting, classic acting. Yes, yes. Like not the slam bam kind of thing. Right. I do watch some of the recent movies now. Any favorite actor? Actor. I think from my Indian actor perspective, I think I like Shah Rukh. Shah Rukh, okay. Okay. He's got a very natural uh, style. Very mm -hmm. natural style. And, what about Hollywood? Any favorites? Hollywood, uh, I would think uh, George Clooney. George Clooney. Mm -hmm. Okay. These guys have got their own charm. Mm. Yeah, got their own charm. They Some of them are like, evergreen. Evergreen, yes. Yeah, so. What about if you were to describe your style in one word? What would that word be? Style in the sense style at work is different. As a personality. Style at work is different. Style outside work. As is a person. As a person. I think very calm. Calm. Very. Collected, okay. uh, hardly ever hassled. Okay. I think it has to do uh, because of my 45 years of meditation now, right? So Fantastic. I started meditation during my engineering days, mm -hmm. late 70s, and I do it even that today. That consistency, I think, yeah. shows, so right? Every day, every day for the last 45 years, I've not missed a single day. Oh wow! Right. I think I think that meditation brings a lot of uh, calm, mm. uh, and you're in control of yourself. You're in control of your emotions, you're in control of your mind. Emotional intelligence is a very important thing these days in the corporate world and in the entrepreneurial world. So that's but your my advice. WhatsApp, my WhatsApp status says that, no, my mind is my best friend. Best friend. <laughs> and it can be the worst enemy as well. Yeah, a... but I don't let that happen. No? So <laughs> my mind is my best friend. I think yeah. once you have that hmm. under your control, yes. right, you, you don't let your mind control it, you control your mind. The mind. I think half your problems in life are taken care of. Right. So that, that's that's my approach. Okay, few questions on some uh, you know uh, business related stuff. Um, what does the word successful mean to you? And uh, who's the first person that comes to your mind when you hear the word successful? What does success mean to you? To me? To you as a person? I think uh, it varied at different stages in my life. So okay. I think when I was in corporate, for me, uh, growing in my career. Uh, was success. Yeah, was success. So I decided when I started my career, I said by the age of 35, I want to become a general manager. By the age of 40, I want to become a CEO. Mm -hmm. I had no clue how, but I decided that's that's my definition of success. So okay. I focused a lot on growing up mm -hmm. the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. and that was success. Every every, every elevation yes. was a success, right? Today, in the last 13 years as a mentor and a coach, right, my definition of success is when I make a difference to somebody else. Fantastic. So I think it's changed a lot. So today, you know, I look at every day as a gift. Mm -hmm. Whose life or whose business can I make a difference with today? Right. So I give a lot of importance to today. Right. So my definition of success is have I made a difference to somebody today? Okay. I feel good. Brilliant. That's my definition of success. Right? Awesome. Thank you. What is the book uh, that is your favorite or you have received that you really, really cherish? Any favorite book of yours? Frankly, I've not been much of a reader, mm -hmm. but uh, a guy called Marshall Goldsmith, mm -hmm. you heard of him. And, yes. Uh, he had once come to Bangalore, so we yes, yes. had a meeting with I met him in Mumbai. Met him in Mumbai. Yeah. So I found him really amazing, the mm -hmm. kind of personality he had, persona he had, and uh, he's such an accomplished coach. Yes. And uh, I think that day he was distributing that book also, What Got You Here Will Not Get You There. Will Not Get You There, yeah. Uh, so that's one book which I have liked. In fact, uh, Using that book, I have done a number of sessions using that theme. 
okay for entrepreneur groups even recently at the vision to reality mm -hmm. the theme of that session was what got to you will not get you there mm -hmm. right because uh, i think those are the principles that people have to realize that what got somebody to this level will not get into the next level so i've used so the agile yeah Adaptable. i've used that book i've used that book theme mm -hmm. not necessarily the contents of the book but the theme of the theme. book right for a couple of webinars which i've done for a couple of sessions which i've done mm -hmm. and i think that's a theme that resonates with a lot of people Sure, getting sure. into the flight. Okay. Uh, if there were a topic that you were to speak on in TED, in a TED talk, which has nothing to do with other than what you do as your core, uh, you know, uh, business that is mentoring, consulting, uh, uh, coaching, what would that topic be? Mindset. Mindset. For me, so it's, it's, for, for me, everything revolves around mindset. Everything, your success in business, your success as an individual, your success in relationships, your success in anywhere, mm -hmm. is all about uh, the mindset and the kind of presence that you carry right. and how people perceive you. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done some talks on executive presence as well, mm -hmm. done sessions around that. Such an important factor, yeah. but often not understood, often not uh, valued as much. Yeah. True. So I think it all starts with a secure mind. Mm. So to me, uh, everything I do also at work is built around the foundation mind. of changing mindset, correcting mindset. Right? I think true. I think that's important. Sure. Um, uh, what is the best or the most worthwhile investment that you have ever made? Uh, and this investment could be in terms of money, time, your energy, or any other resource that you. you felt that this is the best investment of my time or my energy or my money that i have made meditation meditation so uh, having started off like i said 45 years ago and seen the benefit of it while i'm studying itself in my college days mm -hmm. i just sustained it through right uh, i i started with a couple of my classmates none of them are continuing it ah, possibly okay. one of them is doing it but I have seen the benefit. I've experienced the benefit, and I think a lot of others have experienced the benefit of uh, that. So I think it's, it's not. But I think consistency is the key, right? Consistency is the key. So I'm very disciplined. I'm very disciplined that way. Yeah. Uh, I think those are the things that actually make a difference: discipline, consistency, the right values, mm -hmm. and uh, those carry you through. True. So I think meditation has been like a foundation for me. Mm -hmm. And here's a funny one. If you have one gigantic billboard that you can put up, say in Kolkata area, uh, what would it say? About me. A message that you want to give out on the billboard. <laughs> message on the billboard would be. Uh, I would again think it will come back to mindset. Mindset. It'll come back to mindset in terms of you know how controlling your mind and how controlling your mind actually is the answer to most of the problems, problems. in life. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, a lot of my work revolves around mindset. It's always revolved around mindset, and I think to large to large extent, I think entrepreneurship and business is mindset. It's mindset. Well. Everything is mindset. Right. Life is mindset. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can mess up your life or you can enjoy your life depending on the state of your mind. True. True. So. Uh, In fact, when whenever I'm doing coaching or whenever I'm doing mentoring, uh, I make it a point to bring in this whole aspect of mindset. meditation, mm -hmm. meditation, oh, meditation. Mindset, okay. particularly okay. in coaching. Okay. When I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one coaching, mm -hmm. I find a lot of people are stressed out, you know, trying to juggle mm -hmm. uh, family, relationships, work, bosses, mm -hmm. and uh, I encourage them to want to look at something like a meditation that will, uh, can actually, you know, yeah. help you. So mm -hmm. I encourage a lot of them to go that, take that route. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's cut out for that. Not everybody can do it. But at least I get them to think that you know sooner or later it may be good for you if you get started. Sure. So that's that's influencing change in, in my own small way you know, with individuals. That's very nice. Everybody you touch. Mm -hmm. uh, if there could be one um, key message that you would want to give to the audience, something that they will think about, they. you need them to mull over and probably even you know transform the way they think or act what would that that one powerful message that you want to give to the audience to entrepreneurs uh, to, yes yeah to entrepreneurs i would i always say this one thing that uh, being an entrepreneur is a very lonely journey mm. very very lonely journey mm. 
and uh, I always say, don't fight your battle alone. Mm -hmm. Never ever fight your battle alone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whoever it is, need not be a mentor, need not be me, need not. But get somebody who is there as a sounding board, somebody who will challenge you, somebody who will you not know, take you. Uh, and tell you straight in the face if you are doing something wrong. Mm. Right? So I think that whole message is about, I've seen the entrepreneurs who take help mm. are the ones who succeed. Okay. So I always say asking for help is not a, it's not a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. Asking for help is a sign of strength. A sign of strength that look, I know that I am struggling. Mm. I know I can't do this myself and I'm asking for help. Mm. A lot of people hesitate to ask for help. Mm. Uh, they think that no asking for help means I'm basically saying that my company is not doing well. Mm. So I said no. The only way you can do differently is by you know really asking for help at the right time. Mm. Choose the right person. I mean whoever the right person you think is. Mm. And secondly, I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, you know hesitate to invest mm. in mentors, coaches, uh, right. facilitators, mm. because they see it as a cost. Mm. And they really don't know what result they're going to get. Yeah. Right. So they say, look, we'll hire somebody and we'll spend so much, we don't know whether it will happen or not. Mm -hmm. So there again, it's, I think it's a mindset game, right? Talk right. to other entrepreneurs. Uh, there could be other entrepreneurs who've taken help and done well. Right. And in fact, today all my business comes that way. Somebody mm. else is referring me. I, mean, mm. I don't go looking for them. Somebody right. else who experienced uh, you know, work with me, has referred me to somebody else, right? Correct. So their resistance is reduced because it's come as a recommendation from somebody they know well. Yes. Right? yes. But I see a lot of entrepreneurs are part of various entrepreneur groups, mm. networks, mm. but they come, they listen, they go, mm. right? and they continue struggling. Mm. So use networks uh, wisely. I think I think there's a lot of uh, you can a lot you can get out of different networks. Sure. Uh, because each network will have a mix of uh, different kinds of people. Different skills different and Different skill sets. If you find, okay, these are three or four people in this network who I really resonate with and I think they can add a lot of value to me. Hmm. Spend more time with them. I think they're more than happy to you know, spend time with you. So a lot of people are part of networks, hmm. but they don't use it uh, effectively. effectively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think choose the right networks and, net and networking is a skill again. Networking is a skill. True. Uh, and how do you not just show up, but how do you contribute, how do you add value to others? Yes. That's when you gain respect in that network. Right. right? It's not network. just about taking, it's giving no, it's as about, well. In fact, uh, if you ask me, my philosophy has always been about giving. Giving, yeah. When you mm -hmm. give unconditionally, you get back as well. Right? True. So, network The universe make notes of yeah, all yeah, these, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, the gifts. All the gifts. <laughs> because when you give, you know, you, it comes back at some point of yes, time. And yes. So, in a network also, I would say always, uh, Entrepreneurs may be part of three or four networks, but uh, build relationships which are meaningful there mm -hmm. and actually start to uh, gain uh, exper experience and expertise from people in those networks. Sure. Mm -hmm. So it's all about taking help, uh, asking for help if required, and using networks to your advantage. I think, sure. I think that, that would really be the, the summary. And, uh, uh, like I said, in terms of scaling up, it's not an easy journey. Mm -hmm. Scaling up is not an easy journey. Mm -hmm. It needs somebody to handhold you on that journey. Right. And yeah. uh, that handholding is something that they need to experience to see the benefit. Okay. Thanks, uh, Cheryl. I'm just going to summarize that for our audience. Sure. So, uh, seek help. Entrepreneurship is a lonely journey. Uh, do not hesitate. Do not be shy about asking for help. Uh, look for good networks where you can learn and grow. Networking is a very key skill for entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, also, do not look at business mentoring, coaching and consulting and all these as costs because the way you can uh, you know, derive value out of it, it could be uh, 5x or 10x from what you even expected, right? We, we never know how it, it is going to... Uh, uh, pan out for you. So do not look at it as a cost, but rather look at it as an investment. investment yeah, yeah. It's an investment, right, to grow your and scale your business. And scaling is not an easy journey. It requires hand holding. So find the right kind of mentors, coaches to help you in this uh, in this journey, right? Hand hold you through this journey. So that I think summarizes. Yeah. What so what I've also done, Deepa, is that uh, because I know this entrepreneurship is such a vast area. Mm. I think uh, during the COVID time. 
I put together something like I think 30 odd videos mm -hmm. in my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. which is a separate. Uh, we'll share the link. Uh, uh, separate, in the description there's a separate below. playlist yeah. on entrepreneurship. So it okay. covers different facets of entrepreneurship. It could right. be HR, it could be marketing, it could be sales, it sure. could be customer care. Sure. So that also is something that people could listen in and you know, take in. Uh, what work they can absorb from that. Absolutely. So that's again a way of, of sharing. Sharing. With yeah, people absolutely. you don't come into contact with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So using the that media to do that. Thanks for sharing those wonderful nuggets of uh, insight, the wisdom and the business uh, you know experience that you have had over four decades, uh, Cherry. And I think that is going to be a great learning, lots of things to think about, think through, mull over. It's not something that can be amassed and yeah. just one hour, it's something that needs to be thought through. What is important for uh, you as a business leader? What is it that resonates with you? And how do you, uh, you know, take that first step towards growing and scaling your business? Absolutely. Right, that's uh, a great, uh, you know, insight that you shared. And I hope our audience is going to listen in, think through the, those key points, those nuggets of wisdom, and then of course, feel free to reach out if you want more insights and more help in growing and scaling your business. Cherin, thanks so much for Thank being so much. with us on the show. <laughs> really appreciate uh, you know no. your uh, precious time and the great uh, uh, you know uh, thoughts that you shared with all the audience. Thank you. Thank and you. we we hope to have you again in, uh, on our show. No, I think uh, as the work up. that you're doing on Growth Calibre, I think, is fantastic. I think because the different kinds of people sharing is going to add so much of value to you know a whole lot of True, and in fact, how do you change that? Uh, we were talking about how, how the uh, you know investor ecosystem has yeah. changed the startup, uh, you know, yeah. the growth story, right? So how do we bring back the focus on building sustainable? Sustainable. You growth. said sustainable. How do we bring back the focus on growing and scaling organizations that are sustainable? That's our focus, and having uh, you know experienced people enrich this learning experience is uh, fantastic thank you so much okay. and we will uh, we would love to have you again uh, you know for follow up sessions on specific focus areas specific focus. based on the uh, questions that our audience has had we will also you know have follow up sessions sure. for them learning sessions Look so uh, thank you so much if any of the uh, audiences viewers have any other questions please do feel free to share it with us and we will get back to you with the appropriate answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.